Hey everybody, it's Carter, and welcome to this episode of Making It Up, the conversation series where I get to sit and chat with writers of all backgrounds. And I always have a good time, and I'm always interested uh, in these people who I usually don't know. And uh, you know, we start chatting, and, and I love to hear their, their their stories. Like, you know, what was your life like as a kid? Where did where did this creativity come from? How do you express it? How do you structure your manuscripts? Um, so it's kind of like inside baseball. For writers. And um, like I said, everybody I talked to is interesting. Uh, and today was no exception. Today I, I spoke to Carla Damron. So Carla is a fiction writer and a social worker and her social work. So she so basically she went to school for psychology, got her degree, got her degree and then became a social worker, which she still does as well today. Um, and it was just interesting to hear how all of her social work informs her writing. I mean, she's on a day-to-day -day basis, she's confronted with a lot of very difficult subjects. Um, and, you know, sometimes writing, I'm sure, is an escape for her. Other times, you know, as she expressed it, you know, she might hear about something that just, it just gets into her soul and she can't, she can't process it almost until she writes a novel about it. Um, so that's kind of interesting. Uh, what's also interesting about her is that she she wrote her first book without much background in writing at all, and then went and got her MFA to learn how to be a better writer. So that's a real that's a real solid commitment. And one of the interesting things she she talks about how is how now that I know how to write, like now I know you know things that I was taught it's almost even more difficult to write now because there's so much to think about. Um, so it's an interesting balance between just wanting to sit and write and then really thinking about the structure of a story and, um, you know, and being true to kind of what she learned getting her MFA. Her most recent book is The Orchid Tattoo, which just came out in September. It looks fantastic. Um, and she's working on a sequel to that right now. Uh, I, I had a fantastic time talking to her. She was really engaging. I felt inspired by her. And it was, it was uh, when we got to our storytelling, man, it just flowed. Like we were visualizing the same thing. We were both challenging each other with some what if thoughts. And, um, and and it was it was it was a good experience. They're not they're not always smooth, <laughs> the storytelling part. But this time I just I, we were we were on the same wave same wave, wavelength. So um, I think you're going to enjoy this one. I know I sure did. This is my conversation with Carla Damron. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Good. You're surviving uh, the remnants of the hurricane, huh? Yeah, we need the rain, but my our power flicked off about a half hour ago, but it's fine now. Uh, so what is what is it like there right now? Is it windy, rainy, all that good stuff? Breathe, some gusts and some kind of light rain. Okay. Well, that's not so bad. Not bad at all. I am sure uh, you've been through worse uh, being in that location. Right. so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're, uh, you're from... South Carolina, right? Mm-hmm. Got it. And you're or in Sumter, which is about an hour from here. Okay. And you're in I, I live in Columbia. Yeah. So I'm I'm actually going to be in Columbia in um in about a month, a little bit less, like three weeks. I'm uh I'm touring uh the campus with my son. Oh wow. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. So he's a senior in high school and uh, we're in Colorado and he's looking at, um, so we're on this trip, we're going to look at um, University of South Carolina and University of Georgia, each of which has kind of the major he's looking into. So we're going to do a little, a little driving tour after we, we land in Columbia. So what's his major? So he wants to study like <clears throat> basically athletic science, like learning, like learning, like training. So, mm -hmm. and there's not a ton of schools that have that as a major. So he's really interested in that. So we'll see how he does. We'll see how he likes the campus. And, uh, you know, my it, husband uh, is teaches at the school of public health. Oh, that's interesting. <laughs> so the exercise science program is actually in his, in his building. <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Huh. Well, I have to let him know a well, small world. Yeah. Um, so you, you know, you're growing up in Sumter and, um, uh, we're, you know, do you have siblings? Yeah, I have an older sister who lives in Oklahoma, and I have a younger brother who is a mime in Sweden. That sounds like a name of a band. 
I know. <laughs> so he so he's literally a mime in Sweden. Yes. And and that, yeah, that does okay doing that? That pays okay? There's demand for Yeah, mime? I mean, he's got his own theater company, he and his wife, and they write their own plays and tour them in schools and they have their own theater in uh, Malmö, Sweden, and um Sweden tends to be pretty supportive of the arts unlike yeah. some other countries that we know. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's done well, yeah. That's awesome. So you it sounds like at least you have like creative and artistic elements in the family. Definitely. My mother was a theater director. Oh, okay. So I was raised in a community little theater, and which that, has really helped my writing, yeah. But that never was a pull for you to go into the performing arts? Not really. I did some, you know, as an amateur just for fun, um, but I never had an interest in really pursuing it. Although I have to say in my writing, I find myself blocking scenes like you would as a theater director. It's really hmm. interesting because I had that in my DNA. Yeah, sure. So it's a you're you're because I'm kind of the same way in the sense of you know I was never in the theater, but I'm very visual when I write, and and I, I take a lot of inspiration, much more so from things that I watch rather than things that I read, and I could just I could just picture the scenes and I could picture like almost camera angles and how and that you know it might not even evidence itself in the writing, but it's how you know I'm able to to tell the story. It sounds like maybe you're a little bit the same way. And to visualize, yeah, to visualizing, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's interesting. So were you, did you have that moment when you're growing up where you're kind of seeing that maybe you have this like creative spark that you might want to do something with or, or did you have a pretty uh, standard childhood? It wasn't standard in that I spent <laughs> so much time in a theater. Yeah, literally. true, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, and I was on stage from the time I was seven in community theater productions. Hmm. Um and so, um, so I do think that that kind of, and, and we studied improvisational theater as kids. Oh, um, that's very stressful for, for a kid. Well, maybe if you're a little kid, you, you don't have any ego. You don't, you don't care. You yeah. absolutely don't care. You just dive right in. Okay. So I do think that got my, that really helped nurture my imagination. Right, right. The whole yes and thing, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's what when we do a storytelling later on, that's the whole thing is like, <laughs> you have to accept whatever I tell you and I have to do the same. And it's great because it really does, depending on who you are, it really sparks these ideas that you might not have ever, like you're almost surprised by yourself. Like I never would have thought I would have thought of this, but you, right. you provided me that element and it triggered this in me. And that's, I, I don't know, I, the exploratory nature of it, I think is so fascinating and when i talk to people who've done improv um mostly as adults you know i'm always so impressed because it is a it is a nerve-wracking thing <laughs> yeah i don't know that i would be as brave doing it now but, but the whole the whole what if exercise is so much of what writing is Totally. I, I've yeah. written essays on what if because mm -hmm. so i'm and we'll get into this in a little bit but uh, do you do you are you a pantser do you not outline I tend to I, I tend to when I begin, I have my main plot thread. Like if I'm doing crime fiction, I know who did it and why they did it. And I might have an idea how it got how they got caught, but everything else I want to pants. Right. Because as I get to know the characters, as they become more real to me, they may go in a direction that I want wouldn't have planned. And I don't want to I don't want to argue with them. <laughs> You know, totally. I need to go in the room they take me. Yeah. And I think it get, gets back to, so I don't outline at all. Um and and I've tried. It's just not in my nature to do it. But mm -hmm. what I find myself doing when I'm writing is that what if like on not even not even necessarily consciously, but I'll be writing something. and I'm like, well, what if, what if this happened? And whatever I'm thinking might just be this crazy idea. And, you know, maybe I discard 80 percent of them. But I've had I've had scenes in the middle of the book. I'm like, what if this person just died right now? This major character like let's I don't know why I think of it, but but all of a sudden it's interesting and you might write a couple of thousand words and decide it's not worth it, but maybe you write it and it changes the course of the narrative and it becomes a surprise to you. And then it becomes a surprise to the reader. I mean, that's one of the most exciting things about writing to me is that discovery through that what if process. And it feels, it almost feels like it's not you. It feels like it's just, you know, you, you get so immersed in it and then suddenly these ideas come and it's like they take you in a direction you had no idea you were going. And it's it's kind of magical and wonderful. It and is. I would think, though, when you're writing 
when you have this loose outline with crime fiction, though, you're still vulnerable with that outline to a major what if that could be like, well, if I do this, it totally changes my perception of what this story was going to be. Do you ever run into that? Yeah, and if it happens, it happens, and you just go. <laughs> right, right. You, just go, you don't argue. I wrote right. a short story about a a, a woman's writing a, a a novel, and the character's watching over her shoulder. The character says, "Oh, I would never say that." Oh, interesting. <laughs> they get into this discussion about what's going to happen, and it's like, of course, who's going to win? Right. You will not win that argument. You're going right. to go in the direction the character takes you. Right, because it's always going to be if you try to force yourself around it. You have to at least explore it, right? And and you might end up changing it, but but if you don't listen to that voice, then it's always going to be nagging at you, uh, and kind yeah. of saying, it's kind of saying, "I told you so," which is, which which you know, it's funny because then you end up writing the book and you've listened to all the voices and everything's how you want it, and then it goes through an editorial process, which all of a sudden you're like, "That's not what my voices were telling me," but I also respect your voice, <laughs> human editor. Right. <laughs> so it's exactly. always it's always a big conflict. Um, so when you're when you're in high school, did you have like a, an idea of what you wanted to study um, in college? Yeah, I thought I would study psychology, which I did study, mm -hmm. and then I and I went to graduate school and got my social work degree. Oh, okay. Oh, right, yeah. right, right, right. So yeah, and so you and you've had a long and and, and continue to exist in the, that space of of social work. Exactly. And my writing, I consider social work as well. Yeah. Oh, for sure. A hundred percent. What what drew you to that field of study and that field of employment? So I, I was interested in psychology because I'm fascinated by how, how people get themselves into traps and what you can do to help mm. them get out of them. You know, just kind of how our brains operate and how we defeat ourselves. I was kind of fascinated with that. And my first job, I worked at a small mental health clinic, very small as a therapeutic assistant, making $9,900 a year. <laughs> Raking it in. <laughs> oh, I mean, I was rich. Um, but I worked for, I worked with three clinical social workers and I loved the perspective of looking at the person and the family system they live in and the community system that they li live in, how those si systems impact them, how they impact the systems. That just fascinated me. So that's what drew me to, to get my degree in that. Is it almost like... A puzzle in a way of like, okay, here's this person and they have these issues. And once we start taking the family history, I can start connecting the dots. Exactly. That's you know, so interesting. Many, yeah. Yeah. How many generations have had this kind of issue? You know, you're, there's all kinds of things to look at, you know, right. even ba the basics. What is your home like? Physically, right. what is your home like? Right. Is there food in the kitchen? You know, right. things like yeah. just sure. the basics. Right. And it's a two part thing, I guess, because one part of it is, um, you know, figuring all that out, the, the cause or the influences. And the second part is, well, how do we, how do we help? And that's what do we do about it? Right. Yeah. And I, I assume there's got to be times when, when, you know, it's, I don't know if it's ever a lost cause, but I'm, I'm sure there's times when it's just like a real challenge to find something that's going to, depending on the severity of the issues, sometimes it's got to be hard to, to find a solution. Exactly. Um, I work right now. I'm working with some kids that supervise. Um, um, I'm supervising some social work students that are working in the school system and we're helping with the kids that they I'm helping them deal with the kids they're dealing with. And it's like they're dealing with poverty and gangs in the street and, you know, just hunger, child hunger. And mm -hmm. you look at those systemic issues and how they affect this child and how they're going to perform in school. And you know, literally, let's give them breakfast. Let's have right. breakfast in the room so that they can come to us first, have some oatmeal before they go to class because they're not going to learn if their stomachs are empty. Right. You know, so, wow. so those yeah. kinds of things. So you look at these systemic issues, and um, and there are so many of them. And it's that's why I write murder mysteries <laughs> <laughs> to brighten up your day after work. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, you know, it, it is, and we're kind of going through this a little bit in, in our own family, but it's interesting to see and to hear about, you know, teenagers. So you're dealing with, with, with kids who, you know, again, going to like the basics, like they don't have the basics, even the kids though, that have the basics, you know, it's, 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 
it, it's it's an epidemic of, of of mental health struggles right now, particularly as we're kind of getting to the end of the pandemic. However, that manifests itself. You know, I'm hearing all the time like, oh, this is it's skyrocketing. Kids who are depressed, who kids are, yeah, these whatever kind of mental health issues. It's unlike never before. And and are you seeing that as well in your work? We're definitely seeing that as big time. And we're also seeing that the resources to help them are fewer. Um, mm. The mental health system is hurting to, to have enough staff. Um, so yeah, that's been, and anger issues. We're seeing a lot of kids with just uncontrolled anger. And then mm. the school system, uncontrolled anger is going to get you suspended. And then where's, you know, so we're, we're trying to do everything we can to help them learn to, you know, learn to manage their emotions so they don't fly off and hit somebody and Hmm. Little across the room, things like that. So, wow. but yeah, we're seeing a lot. It's, it's, I, I think we'll be studying the effects of the pandemic for years to come, oh. not just physically and not just culturally, but just how it's affected the mental health of all of us. Right. It's right. trauma. We all, we all went through trauma. A hundred percent. Yeah. And we're all still going through it and we're still yes. processing it. And, and a lot of people, you know, aren't getting help. You know, I, I know the psychiatrist. She's like, everybody should have a therapist. I don't oh, yeah. care how healthy you think you are. Everybody should have a therapist. And I don't disagree with that, you know, mm -hmm. but it's also not necessarily accessible and affordable to everybody. Exactly. It's, it's very exactly. Un unequal. Um, so, and I want to dig in a little bit more to your work because I think it's interesting how it affects your writing. But at what point in your career are you thinking about writing have you always kind of been interested in writing or did something happen did you get hit on the head yeah i got hit on the head now <laughs> um, i used to write when i was a kid i was okay. a big writer and then i kind of got away from it when i started working it was pretty all-consuming um yeah. social work could be that way but then when i was i guess in my late 30s um i just you know in my family we read mysteries yeah i was in my late 30s and i had i had stopped doing a part part-time evening job that I was doing in addition to my full-time job. Mm -hmm. When I stopped doing that, I had, I was used to making, doing productive things for those three hours right after work. So I said, huh. I'm going to try to write a mystery novel. So I sat down and started writing. And that was my first novel, Keeping Silent. Um, and it came out in, in 1999, no, 2001. It came out in 2001. So when you started writing this book, because I started writing out of the blue with absolutely zero, zero, zero training or previous interest. And so I literally was somebody who didn't know what he was doing. Um, and you right. know, I read, I read some books about, yeah, after I wrote this manuscript, I read some books on how to actually write, but you know, not a whole lot. Did you, did you kind of consult, you know, how do I, you know, what point of view do I write from? How many points of view are the right uh, enough and all that kind of stuff. So, um, yeah, I started with just one point of view because I knew that would be easiest. <laughs> you know, I don't do that now, but back then that's how I started. And um, and I took a class, like an adult ed class. Okay. And what was significant about that was the instructor of that class invited me into her writing group. Mm. And having that writer's group was incredibly helpful. Everybody, every writer should have it, whether you're published or not. Exactly. You need to meet once a month and you need to get beaten up a little bit. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And the other thing is that you, you know, and this is what I tell, tell new writers all the time. You know, I've, I've actually went back and got a second degree. I got my MFA in creative writing. Oh, you I did. did. Okay. I did that to finish my, uh, the stone necklace. Cause that was such a complex book and I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So I went mm -hmm. back to school to kind of figure it out. But before that, I would say, I, I would say the only way to learn how to write a book is to write it. We are yeah. all self-taught. Totally. We're all self-taught. So dive in, make lots of mistakes. Dear Lord, don't try to publish that first draft. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Go back, back and rewrite and learn what you can. Give it to someone you trust to give you honest feedback because writing is communication. Yep. And you only know if the communication's working is if is if the person reading it gets what you meant to say. So you test it out with someone who's going to give you honest feedback. You rewrite, revise. And again, you're all it's all the self-taught process. It's really about shedding the ego um, and because there's so much rejection as a writer. Oh, yeah. And and I came from a position of because I didn't know what I was doing, I, I was very fortunate that I got an agent with my first book, but my first three books didn't sell. And mm -hmm. 
And to me, it was like, well, of course they didn't sell. I don't know what I'm doing. And, and, <laughs> and so, I, but I, I realized I just like storytelling. I really enjoyed the challenge of trying to figure out a story. Um, but you're absolutely right. You just have to, you just have to write it. And that's, that's, I mean, it sounds so stupid, right? Like, but that is the single thing that blocks most people is that actually the act of writing and which is ironic, or at least the act of finishing. Um, yeah, we always stand in our own ways. We always stand in our own way. And the worst is the saggy middle. You know, it's the when you first begin a book, it's so exciting. Right. And the last couple of chapters, you're closing it up. That's so exciting. But that middle, you know, that's where so many books die. It's There's a graveyard of half-finished books. You know? Right, right, <laughs> that's right. It's really sad. You've got to have... You have to have the persistence and you have to have the, you know, if something isn't working, you got to reboot. You got to figure out what's not working and try something different, but not giving up is so important. And and doing it consistently enough that you're treating it as a job. And, mm -hmm. and I preach this all the time. I'm like, a lot of times jobs suck. And a lot of times you're sitting down writing and it feels like data entry and you're not having fun but you're doing it and at the very least, and you might delete all that, what you're writing today, but you're still building that muscle. And once you get that muscle built, um, because the actual physical act of, of crafting like a sentence when you're first starting out is brutal. It's so difficult years later, that's all easy, but the storytelling part is hard, but that's only because you've done it every day for five years. And you've kind of figured that because a lot of people kind of wait for the muse and uh, like, you know, it, it, you're crazy if you're, you're never going to get anything done muses are so unreliable right. you can't hire good muse help these days no i mean <laughs> no totally i mean my muse is vodka you know yeah i have that cocktail and i'm like okay i feel my mind opening up a little bit <laughs> <laughs> so you you published that first book and then you went and got in your mfa which is <laughs> it's just a a, a, bit, a big commitment for sure um how how are you seeing the the intersection of your your day job and your writing? Are you are you drawing upon that? Or are you trying to kind of because I'm picturing you? I'm guessing I'm guessing you're a very empathetic person because I, I find most people in, in in social work have deep wells of empathy. I think some of the best writers are those who are empathetic because they can really put themselves in somebody else's shoes. Are you drawing from those experiences a lot, or are you trying to just write about something i know you write murder mysteries as well but do you try to escape your day job a little bit in your writing i'm all uh, a little bit but mostly it, something will happen or or in my day job that will just stick with me that'll really you know and it's like i've got to find an outlet for this so my my latest book um the orchid tattoo it, I was doing some advocacy work to combat um, human trafficking here in South Carolina. We were trying to get some stronger anti-trafficking legislation passed. And I met these survivors and these law enforcement workers, mm. and I heard these stories that were so riveting and just, they climbed into my soul, these stories that I heard. And it's like, I have got to write something that helps people understand how trafficking happens, how it happens in our own backyard. But I needed to, but I, but I wanted it to also be really good suspense and a really good entertaining book. And so that was the genesis for the Orchid Tattoo. I would say every, I write about social issues, whether I want to or not. Yeah. <laughs> it's just going to come, it's just going to happen. So right. I don't even fight anymore. It's, it's going to happen. And that's got to be an interesting balance to try to strike because, I mean, that's heavy stuff. And, and it's all obviously worthy stuff to write about. But you're you're marrying that with with kind of uh, traditional escapism murder mystery as well. Do you ever find like okay, this was this was received as being like you know it was a great book, but it was just it just depressed the hell out of me <laughs> because of so, all these these real elements. Um, yeah, the earlier versions. That's why I couldn't sell the earlier versions because it was dark and it yeah. had, you know, and so and what I learned from that and from what editors said and even friends like, um, you know, a woman that I'm really close with who's a, a mother started reading it. She says, I just can't read it. Yeah. And I'm like, she's who I need to read it. So right. <laughs> what? how do I make the changes? So what I did was I didn't show anything graphic. Um, 
I decided instead to just dive into the characters so the reader gets to understand what the characters have gone through just from how they responded. You don't see the trauma that they go through, but you see the aftermath of the trauma. But you also see them as survivors and people driven to get better, to make their lives better. Right. So there's that impulse. And then and then just really good suspense where you just, you know, you're dying to find out who is over this operation. You're dying to find out how how Georgia Thayer is going to bring it down. So um, but it took multiple revisions to get to to hit that tone where it's not off putting and still educational and not but also not um, not underselling how awful this crime is so um yeah. so that was that was the balance i had to strike and it took a lot of rewrites and a lot of soul searching on my part to get it to this place yeah and that's where feedback is important and no matter what you do there's always going to be triggers for certain people yeah um, you know my books are pretty dark too but i i'm a firm believer in with both sex and violence to be extremely uh sparse with them and mm -hmm. you know and when you do write those scenes they need to be meaningful they need to be realistic they need to have an impact they need to propel the story forward um but i'm you know but i'm always surprised by when there will always be scenes that I think are like nothing scenes and people are like, Oh, I had to put the book down here because it was too scary. I'm like, really? That was, that was your thing. <laughs> you never know. You, you never, never know. You never know. Um, and also making, put a, we put a trigger warning in the beginning of this for that very reason, you know, um, because I, I really don't want to traumatize anybody and I don't think it would, but I just wanted readers to be aware. But that's interesting too, right? Because you're already, starting out by <laughs> almost telling people not to read the book because <laughs> I find that like, so for example, I killed a dog in, in one of my books and it happened. Uh -oh. I know, I know, I know, I know. <laughs> it happened off camera. You don't even know who this dog is. This dog was never in the story. It's just two cops saying we found this dog on the green belt. And it had been murdered. That was literally the extent of it. Goodreads, then all of a sudden, reviewers had trigger warnings all about this book about animal torture and cruelty. And I'm like, why are you like, <laughs> what book <did> you read? <laughs> but, but people, and then people reply, oh, thank you for letting me know. I'll never read anything by this guy. And I'm like, wow. Like, uh, trigger warnings are very like interesting to me because you are doing a service, which I totally agree with. But sometimes people might be like, I don't know if I would be triggered by that, but now I'm not going to read it. I don't know. It, exactly. It's very interesting, but I mean, exactly. you're, you're taking a responsible step. Um, have you, what have you found over the years, over your writing career in terms of how you've been able to improve? Do you see it evidence itself in your writing? Do you see, you know, when you look back on stuff, you see like, wow, this book is so much better because of X, Y, or Z, because I took this MFA class, um, or just because you've just been writing a lot. Yeah, I would say, well, school helped tremendously. Um, school is, you know, it's, it, we use the workshop format. And so it was, you know, really diving deep and um, getting bruised, getting flayed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but, you know, really learning that, you know, that this, what I thought was okay was really not where it needed to be. So that was incredibly helpful. Also, every book I've written has taught me something about writing. Mm -hmm. Um I find I find that what's interesting is I find writing is a little harder than it was when I knew less. <laughs> I totally believe that. Yeah, it's like dang, I wish I was ignorant. <laughs> but um, but I find too that you know as I mature, as I'm older, and, and kind of under have more insights into how people think and operate, that makes my characters richer. I think my characters are much more complex and richer. Even my bad guys, right? Um, making them making them well rounded and complex, um, so that you don't necessarily have sympathy for them, but you understand how they got to be the way they are. Yeah, and they're not pure. There's not. It's not black and white. There's a whole lot of gray. Yeah, that's one of the most important parts of writing in mystery suspense. Is you know, you know, the hero or the antagonist are. <laughs> not too far off in terms of those shades of gray, right. you know, right. and that's, that's what, I mean, first of all, that's realistic. And I, I love a villain, you know, I don't even like using the word villain, but like, I love a villain who just a hundred percent absolutely believes what he or she is doing. Like, you know, not in, in a, in a, in a villainous way, but in like, this is, 
this is my perception of reality. And this is, you know, I'm trying to do the best by what I understand. I, I think that's fascinating personally. I do too. You just kind of die, the, my current um, project is a, the fourth in the Caleb Knoll series. And uh, one of my, bad guys is a gun he, he runs a gun store munition store and he is just all about getting guns on the street because that makes some money and he's yeah. all you know it's just fascinating he's, he's so 100 percent opposite from what that could ever ever be right but, but you know it, it makes him lucrative and he loves money and it's just kind of how he's driven what what inspires him you know right. really or maybe you know that's the only thing he knows how to do. And he needs that money to literally put food on the table for his family. Right. right you right. know, so it's, it, it is kind of interesting. I mean, so, um, and are you, are you seeing a different trajectory as you mature in your writing in terms of like, you know, wanting to write something different, wanting to, to write in a, in a, you know, in a different realm at all, or you, you, cause you're writing a series right now. Right. So I've written, I wrote the, the Caleb Knoll series. And then, um, the, the book that I wrote right before the orchid tattoo is called the stone necklace. And that is not crime fiction at all. That's a kind of women's fiction. Mm -hmm. It won the women's fiction award, uh, star award for best oh, novel. That's um, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, um, and it is, it was really, really complex it's from five it has five point of view characters oh wow and it's about a family that's in a state you know grieving the loss of a father and just kind of how it affects them um and um and you know just it's about these five lives that intersected this event of a car crash um and just mm. how that car crash changed them and so that was really complex and very challenging um and so then i went back to write the orchid tattoo and so i kind of write what what i feel compelled to write mm -hmm. i don't you know, I don't, I'm my own boss when it comes to this. Yeah. And, yeah. So I don't, I write what I feel compelled to write, what's really grabbing me right now. So, yeah. so that's interesting because, you know, that's, you know, women's fiction, like when you think about quote unquote literary fiction versus maybe suspense or mystery, the tone, the pacing, the, exactly. um, the, the, the loose ends, totally different. And, you that's know, why I, I had to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> I would, you know, it's funny because I think I would be scared to learn kind of more about how to write because I'm established enough where I, I know what, I mean, literally brings me joy when I write it. That's to me, that's the most important thing. And I think if I were really heavily thinking about whatever the hero's journey, you know, all these different elements you can think about. I think I'd get confused and I, I would, I would get caught up in that. So, I, and you kind of, your point was exactly that. Like it's harder now that I know how to write. The more I learned, the harder it is. Yeah. But, um, but you know, I learned to what school taught me too, was just the, you know, just how to love a paragraph, you know, right. you know just when countering like, um, and, and I love when crime fiction has a literary bent. Um, totally. I love the author, John Hart. Oh yeah, He's, you know, he, his suspense is riveting, but you could just look at a paragraph that he wrote and just go, you know, just savor it. Just kind of, it's just beautiful prose. It's right, you know, it, it strikes the right mood. It's a great use of adjectives. I love this, the flow of sentences. Right, you know, and I it's can, not I mean, overdone. Yeah. Oh no, it's it's yeah, not pithy. at all. Yeah, that's. I mean, when I and, and that's you know, all about the editing, right? So when you're going through your book. And you're you hate it at this point, right? Because you've already spent so much time with it. But when you're when I'm revising a book, I try to look at every paragraph or every scene. And if I particularly don't like it, I really look at it as like, how can I make this not only better, but extraordinary? And and it's a real challenge. And, and but yeah. a lot of times it's about cutting out words. <laughs> you know, it's about like oh, yeah. it's about like how can I how can I distill this to an essence that's maybe six words that really like becomes a flavor that, that, you know, it, that really pops and it's hard to do, but it's, it, it really the challenge is. is the good part of it. It's exciting and frustrating. Mm -hmm. um, so I write from a uh, close third perspective or first person, I kind of go back and forth. And so I'm always in a character's head. 
Right. So even those paragraphs need to be written as though that character would perceive them. You know, that's right. where the act, the, the theater background comes into play because well, it's that's like, where the empathy comes into play. Yeah, exactly. How would how would this fifth? 15 year old um, woman, girl who's trying to escape human traffickers, see the sky. Right. You know, how would she feel the gravel as she's running, you know, um, as opposed to how the more mature Georgia, the protagonist, would, would experience those things. Um, right. I, I love that, though. I love diving into those characters. And I, I swear I get kind of mentally ill with it. They're like, I dream about them. They're just oh, wow. very, very real. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm just the opposite. I, I write one hour a day seven days a week and I don't even, th I rarely think about it. And I sit down, I'm like, where was I? What was I? I'm like, Oh yeah. And then I'm in this, I fall into this world and nothing else matters. And then an hour later I I'm done. And, and I it just kind of, but it's almost like just getting it out of my system every day. I'm the opposite. I'll be like it. I'll wake up at three in the morning and I'll be like, how am I going to get her out of this situation? <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah. man. You know, now, would, now, would you started. actually like get out of bed and write something down so you don't forget it? I'm not usually, but usually I'll remember. Um, yeah. I'll just kind of ponder and I'll kind of go to sleep still thinking about it. And then when I wake up in the morning, the first thing I want to do is get up, grab my coffee, and start writing. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I oh, I gosh. only write in the evening, so yeah, we're 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 different about that. But I but but then I look forward to it all day. You know, yeah. I, I know that like I've got everything else done because I I have a full time job as well, and so when I sit down at five o'clock to write, I'm like, it's my it's my escape and my time to world build. And it's, you know, and it just strengthens the brain, you know, oh, exercising yeah. that creative freedom is so good for the mind. It really is. It keeps, yeah. And I, I think my imagination is, is really important to me. I mean, it's, it's, it's oh, a yeah. lot. Of, it's, it gives me a lot of joy and pleasure. So oh, yeah. yeah. I guess you wouldn't really know any different if you weren't an imaginative person, right? Like, you know, you wouldn't be like yearning to have an emergency imagination. You probably just wouldn't know any better, but it's uh, right. because sometimes right. an act of imagination is a little bit of a burden, you know, True. because, because <laughs> what you're saying, you're waking up at three in the morning thinking about plot. You know, if you, if you, if you were a dullard, you would just sleep really well. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so um, the Orca tattoo just came out. What's uh, what, uh, what's coming up next for you? So the fourth, not in the Caleb Knoll series uh, called Justice Be Done. I think it's going to come out. The publishers accepted it. And we're working on, I just got his edits and I'm uh, working on those. So I think it'll come out in 2023, although we don't have a date yet. He's a very, it's a very small publisher. Yeah. And then I started drafting the sequel to the Orchid Tattoo with the same oh. characters, some of the same characters. So I've, uh, I'm really having fun with that. I'm about 80 pages into that new book. So you're, you're, you're clearly enjoying continuing characters, continuing storylines. Um, does that, does that make it like when you're writing this series, does it make it difficult to think like, Oh, I can't, I want to, I maybe want to kill this person, but I can't because they need to be around for the next book. Do you run into that? Yeah, you do. Those are really <laughs> important decisions. If you're going to kill somebody, that's yeah. a really, it's a, it's a pretty critical. No coming back from that. <laughs> Yeah. But on the other hand, I love knowing the characters so well and watching how they change. We all change over time. Right. So, you know, you know, Caleb, um, the, my, he was kind of a wild man in his twenties. Well, now he's more mature and he's, he's a little more settled, but still gets himself in trouble because I love really flawed characters. My characters are incredibly flawed. Totally. Like I, so, yeah. So I love to kind of see what kind of trouble he's getting himself into, you know, that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, we're going to wrap up before we do, we're going to do a little impromptu storytelling. All um, right. This, this is the fun part of the podcast where I'm going to, I have three books that I just picked off my bookshelf. You're going to choose one of the books and we're going to pick a random sentence from a random page. I'm going to read that sentence. And then that's the first line of a very two minute long short story. You give me the next sentence or two or whatever you want. And then I'll do a couple and then I'll call it at some point. Okay. Um, so I've got, uh, the, these are all hard covers. The Girl Who Died, uh, Steve Barry's The Romanov Prophecy, okay. and R.H. Heron's Stolen Things. Um, so choose one of those. Let's do The Girl Who Died. Okay. This is actually a signed copy from Ragnard 
Jonathan, uh, give me a um, page number between one and 350. 11. Oh, I don't think anyone's ever chosen 11 before. Um, and give me a, a sentence number between, let's say, one and 10. Four. This is going to, it's a good opening kind of type of line. All right, so I'm going to read it now. It was an unusually fine August day, mild with not a breath of wind stirring the leaves and even the odd glimpse of sun. The sky was a pale blue. I could see a flock of geese honking the way across the horizon, loud as always. I took a sip of my coffee, knowing I had to go back inside the house soon, but also knowing it was the last thing I wanted to do. I'm not sure what I was going to say to him. But I know if I didn't say the right thing, it was going to change both of our lives forever. It was always like that with him. Me living on, on a knife, knife's edge, anxious, scared, determined to do the right thing. And there never was a right thing. But maybe I was framing it wrong the entire time. Because when I thought of what was the right or wrong thing, it was always about talking. It was always about discussing. Discussions that became arguments. But I never actually did anything. I never took action. And maybe that's what needed to happen now. Maybe today was the day. I would go into the house. I would open my suitcase. I would put my clothes in and dare him to stop me. I walked back in the house, put my coffee cup in the kitchen sink, steeled myself, and did exactly that. I grabbed the suitcase and started putting clothes in while he slept in the bed. I could hear him stir, so I picked up my pace. I heard his feet shuffling up the hall. When he entered the doorway to my room, he said, so this is what's going to happen. You think you can get away with it? I don't know why I was trying to kid myself. This was exactly what I knew he was going to say. I wasn't going to pack and leave. I was inviting a confrontation that I'd been wanting for 15 years. And he was ready for it. I could tell. I could see it in the dark glint of his eyes. All right, let's call it there. That's great. <laughs> Boy, that was going to get violent pretty fast. Yeah. <laughs> Crime writers, you know, what's going to happen? <laughs> that was great. I could, I, so were you, because I was very much visualizing the house she was on a porch you know I, I pictured everything i don't know if you're the yeah. same way where you could really see it yeah i was ex i was anxious for her <laughs> <laughs> yes yeah for sure but i also pictured her as being like much more capable and, and, and aggressive than she had ever given herself credit for so i like the idea that she was like she wasn't going to like try to leave. She was just trying to provoke um, right. because she, she was just like, it's, it's now or never. <laughs> so for each of us, it was, what if, what if we totally, did totally. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's, that's the joy of writing. Carla, what a pleasure was talking to you and congratulations you so on your much. recent release. And uh, it was fascinating to hear about the orchid tattoo and everything else you have going on and um, all your, your wonderful work um, and yeah, how that, you know, reflects in your writing. And yeah, you, you were, you're a very interesting person. I enjoyed talking to you. This has been a lot of fun. Awesome. Well, stay safe in the uh, hurricane remnants. <laughs> okay. I appreciate it. All right, take care, Carla. Bye. Bye. So that's it. That was my conversation with Carla Damron. That was great. I love and I love in particular the storytelling. Um, it's just invigorating somehow. It's scary. And then once you're done, you're like, all right, I really liked um, feeling my uh, uh, synapses firing. So it was that was that was a good one with her. And if you want to find out more about Carla, and I suggest you do, please just go to her website, uh, CarlaDamron.com. Her latest book, The Orchid Tattoo, is out now. And uh, if you want to find out more about me, uh, just go to CarterWilson.com. You can sign up for my newsletter. Um, you can see where my books are selling. You can check out my appearances. All that good stuff. So that's it for now. As always, friends, thank you for watching and or listening to this. Uh, more episodes of Making It Out will be out soon. In the meantime, take care. <laughs>